everybody. So uh, today we again have this, you know, uh, virtual seminar on biological physics and physical biology. Today we are very happy to uh, host two uh, wonderful speakers, Sujit Dutta from Princeton University and Ann Meyer from the University of Rochester. And uh, hi, Ann and Sujit. And I guess I want to, by now you're all experts, uh, in, you know, in our Zoom adequate, but like I wanted to mention briefly, uh, please use your full name on Zoom so that when you ask questions, we can call you, call, you know, your name out completely. And to write your full name, you can hover over your photo and rename yourself so that you have both your first name and your last name. And during the talk, uh, please mute yourself and you can type questions in the chat box. If there is a clarifying question, then I uh, am the moderator for today's talk and I will ask that question immediately. If there are longer questions, we will take those questions at the end of the talk and uh, during the Q&A. And at the end of both talks uh, at noon, so between 12 and 12.15, we will have a 25 minute informal discussion in addition to the usual five minute Q&A at the end of the talk. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that the talk is being recorded. So I guess without that, uh, with that, without any further ado, I will uh, uh, let Sujit get started. So Sujit, take it away. Okay. Um, let's do this. Okay, perfect. So you can see my slides? Yes, we can see our slides. Okay, um, so I'll get started. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, and thank, a special thank you to uh, the organizers for putting together this incredible seminar series. Um, I've learned so much over the past few weeks, um, and I'm really excited to see the talks that are to come. And it's really an honor for me to get to be a part of this and share some of our work with you all today. So thank you for the invitation. Um, so as Munita mentioned, my name is Sujit. I'm an assistant professor at Princeton, where I've been uh, for the past three years. And today I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been up to over the past three years, studying how bacteria move in heterogeneous media. So first I just wanna start out by highlighting the people who actually made this work possible. So all the experiments that I'll tell you about today were led uh, by an incredible postdoc in my lab, Tapa Patacharji, who um, by the way is on the job market. So if uh, any of you are looking for someone in this area, uh, look no further just send me an email. Um, and Tapa has been working with Daniel, who's an incredible graduate student in the lab, who's been leading the theory and simulations as part of this uh, body of work. Um, and Tapa and Daniel have been working closely with a new graduate student in the lab, Jenna, who is also incredible and has been making um, con contributions to both the experiments and the simulations. And of course, we don't live in a vacuum. Um, we've benefited tremendously from interactions with our colleagues, both at Princeton and elsewhere some of whom are listed here. And uh, we look forward to interacting with many of you in the future. So um, first, I just want to start off by uh, talking about what exactly I mean by heterogeneous media and why we care about how bacteria move in heterogeneous media. So one common example is all around. The ground beneath the, your feet is uh, an example of a heterogeneous media. Soil, sediments, the aquifers we get our drinking water from, oil and gas reservoirs, these are all examples of heterogeneous media comprised of solid grains that are packed together in a disordered packing. So this is an x-ray CT image of soil, and you can see that there's this disordered pore space through which fluids and chemicals and bacteria have to move, and um, understanding how confinement in this tight and torturous space impacts uh, uh, bacterial motility is fundamentally interesting, but it's also important in agriculture, in water remediation and oil and gas recovery. Another example of a class of heterogeneous media you're all familiar with is, of course, um, tissues and gels in your own bodies. Uh, and so, of course, I have to put this picture up uh, in all of my talks. This is my daughter, Aiko, who is a year and a half now. Um, and here you can see she's uh, incredibly cute, she's uh, happy, and she's doing what babies do best. She is slobbering all over the place. Right, and so this uh, process is adorable and it's also important for her health because mucus is a heterogeneous porous medium, right? For example, in the lungs, we know that mucus is a polymer solution uh, that helps to 
uh, regulate transport of pathogens uh, and regulate how pathogens uh, infect your underlying epithelium or clump together and form infectious biofilms. Similarly, in the gut, mucus forms a hydrogel that lines the surface of your gut. This is something I've studied in the past. Um, and in that case, again, the mesh-like structure of this network helps to protect the underlying epithelium against pathogens from getting through. I also just want to highlight that Raghuvir Parthasarnathi gave a beautiful talk a few months ago as part of the seminar series on how uh, motility of uh, various bacteria uh, influences their colonization of the zebrafish gut. So if you missed that, please check it out. It's on YouTube. Another example is your own tissues, which are you know, collections of your cells that are held together by an extracellular matrix, which again is porous and it has these little pores that infectious bacteria can move through and lead to the spread of disease. Alternatively, uh, we're interested in using genetically engineered microbes to burrow through these little pores and deliver drugs to hard to reach spots of your body. Finally, bacterial communities themselves can be heterogeneous media. Biofilms are a great example of bacterial communities that, again, the cells are encased in an extracellular matrix, which has a mesh-like structure, and that structure regulates transport through that biofilm. And so in all of these cases, we typically have heterogeneous disordered porous media where the pores are typically on the order of hundreds of nanometers to tens of micrometers in size, right? Um, so these are tight spaces. Just to give you uh, a sense of scale, the cell body length of E. coli, which is uh, you know, one of the canonical examples of a motile bacterium, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, the cell body length is two microns. Uh, and additionally, their flagella are between five to 10 microns long. And so these are really confining spaces. And so the central question that we've been addressing is how do bacteria move through these tight and tortuous spaces? And of course, this is fundamentally very interesting, right? Both in deepening our understanding of bacterial motility, but also uh, the motion of active matter in heterogeneous environments. But also it's important in agriculture, because we want to be able to predict and control how bacteria move through soil and interact with plant roots and help sustain plant growth. It's important in bioremediation, right? We want to be able to apply beneficial bacteria to migrate through contaminated soils and sediments and aquifers and reach contaminants and degrade them in situ. And of course, it's important in your health, both in predicting and controlling the spread of disease and in using beneficial bacteria for drug delivery. And these are some of the applications that motivate the work that we do. So of course, if we're gonna talk about bacterial motility, we have to first talk about what we know about how bacteria move in bulk liquid or on flat surfaces, which is typically how they're studied, how they've been studied over the past 300 years. Um, and for the case of E. coli, which is one of the canonical examples of uh, flagellated bacteria, right? They move through what's known as run and tumble motility. This is a movie from Howard Berg's lab that's done a lot of the foundational work on this subject, right? The cell body has these appendages known as flagella, which rotate. And when they all rotate synchronously, they form a flagellar bundle. You can see various examples here. This flagellar bundle rotates together and it pushes the cell body along a straight path at a constant speed, right? And that's known as a run. And uh, that lasts about two seconds for the conditions that we've been exploring. And then after about two seconds, one or more of the flagella spontaneously goes in the wrong direction. And that causes this flagellar bundle to splay out, which causes a hydrodynamic force that reorients the cell body randomly. And then very quickly, the flagella rebundle continue to spin synchronously and push the cell body along a different direction, another run. Right? And that reorientation process is known as a tumble, and it's effectively instantaneous compared to a run. It occurs on a time scale of the order of 100 milliseconds, which compared to a run of two seconds is very, very fast. And so over large length and time scales, right, this bacterium performs a random walk. And because it performs a random walk, you can model how these bacteria spread out in bulk liquid or in flat surfaces using the diffusion equation which is a very elegant finding. And you can write down the diffusion coefficient. It's given by the run speed times the run length, right? And this is a beautiful picture that's been validated uh, over decades for bacteria in liquid media or in bulk surfaces. And our question is, 
well, how has this picture changed when you now can find these bacteria in a heterogeneous porous medium? Right. And the short answer is, before we started this work, we didn't really know because you can't actually look at what's going on inside soil or a sediment or a tissue, right? They're opaque, but you can construct models of this process. Um, today, I'll tell you about some of the work we've been doing, looking at the motility of individual cells of E. coli in heterogeneous media. So that was reported in these two papers, right? And I'll give you a brief glimpse of our recent work looking at collective migration of dense populations in heterogeneous media. And we just posted this work on the bioarchive a few weeks ago. And so in bulk liquid, you have run and tumble. Typical models often assume that the cells still perform run and tumble behavior in a heterogeneous medium, but now because the cells are colliding with the walls of the solid matrix around them, these runs are truncated, right? And so the simplest possible model you can make is you can say that in this dense matrix, the bacteria are reoriented by collisions as well. And so this still performs a random walk, but now the length scale is shorter, right? Now the length scale is given by the pore size. So you can still write down the diffusion coefficient. It's given by the run speed, which is assumed to be unaltered, times the shortened run length, which is typically of order of the pore size, right? And so this, again, is a really elegantly simple model. The problem is that it often doesn't work. When you do the simplest possible experiment, you take a porous medium and you put it in contact with a suspension of motile bacteria at one end and measure how long it takes for the bacteria to swim through the pores and reach the other end, right, and extract a diffusion coefficient from that and compare it to this prediction. Often the experiments are one to two orders of magnitude smaller than what you predict. And so clearly we're missing something. And so this has been a puzzle for several decades and we set out to resolve this puzzle by actually making our own heterogeneous media that are transparent, right? So we can actually see what the cells are doing. So um, this is kind of like an ant farm for cells. I don't know if uh, uh, some of you, uh, when you were kids, might have played with ant farms when you were a kid, uh, right? Ant farms let you spy on what ants are doing, how they actually live and behave in soil, right? This is our version of an ant farm for bacteria. So what we do is we use hydrogels. We take biocompatible hydrogel particles, which are these particles that are cross-linked uh, networks of a hydrophilic polymer that swells up in an aqueous medium. We take the dry powder, right? And we redisperse it in whatever liquid culture medium you wanna use. So we use a defined rich medium uh, for E. coli. And so depending on how much of this dry powder you disperse into the liquid medium, right? The hydrogels swell up and eventually they jam up against each other. And if you add more and more of the dry powder, you get an increasingly denser packing. If you add less and less, you get a looser and looser packing. So we've measured the mesh size of these hydrogels and it's between 40 and 100 nanometers. So it's actually quite large. These are highly swollen uh, particles. And so what that means is, for small molecules, for oxygen and nutrients, right? They don't even see the solid matrix. They diffuse through unimpeded. But for the cells, which are larger, right? They can't go into the hydrogel particles. They must move around them. They have to go through the pores formed in between the hydrogel particles, right? So this gives us a way to isolate the role of geometric heterogeneity in influencing how cells move. And so here's an example of what the pore space looks like. Here we diffuse some fluorescent tracers through the pore space. This is a time projection. You can see that it's a highly tortuous pore space. The black circles here are the hydrogel particles. And using these diffusion measurements, we can then quantify what this smallest pore dimension is, which is one way of measuring the pore size. And we can look at the distribution of those pore sizes. So here are four different porous media, which we've prepared by dispersing four different amounts of the hydrogel particles, right? And I just want to point out, this system is mainly water. These packings are made of between half and 0.85% of the dry mass fraction of hydrogel. It's over 99% water. But because the hydrogel swell up so much, right, these small mass fractions give you these jammed packings. And so with the loose packing, we have pores going from 1 to 13 microns in size. We can go all the way to tighter packings where the pores are between 1 and 4 microns in size. 
We've played with this and extended this range in more recent work. And so now we can tune very nicely the pore size distribution of these porous media. And most importantly, because these systems are mainly water, they're completely transparent, right? These packings are completely transparent. And so we can seed cells into the pore space and visualize them in 3D with confocal microscopy. And so that's what we do, right? The first experiment that I asked Tapa to do is I asked him to take fluorescent E. coli and just disperse it in the pore space at a dilute concentration and just watch what happens. Just watch them move. Because we wanted to know, are they actually performing run and tumble motion as everyone assumes? And I'm just gonna jump to the punchline, right? This movie is one of the first movies that Tapa showed me of E. coli moving in these uh, heterogeneous porous media. These are two independent cells. The movies are just gonna keep looping. And when Tapa showed me these movies, I fell out of my chair. I was completely blown away because these cells are clearly not performing run and tumble motion, right? I told you about how in run and tumble, the tumbles are effectively instantaneous. So the cell performs a run and another run and another run. Here, you can see these cells are getting stuck. As they move through the pore space, they hit tight spots and they get stuck transiently and the cell body constantly reorients itself until it finds the right orientation, until it can keep moving through the pore space, and then it gets stuck again. Right? This actually looks a lot like how thermal systems, how thermally activated colloidal particles move in dense suspensions or in polymeric networks. Right? They rattle around in little cages and they hop out and they rattle again. Right? It also looks kind of like what charges do in amorphous conductors. Right, where charges get localized at certain spots, and then they hop between those traps. And so by analogy to those other thermal systems, we call this hopping and trapping. This is a distinct mode of motility exhibited by E. coli in heterogeneous porous media. That's distinct from run and tumble behavior. And so we've characterized this motility in quite a lot of detail. We uh, included those details in this Nature Communications paper, as well as the follow-up soft matter, but I'll give you some of the highlights of what we found, right? For the cell to move through the pore space, it goes, it hops from site to site, right? So one question is what determines the length of a hop, right? What determines that length scale over which it moves? And our hypothesis was, well, the cells are still trying to perform run and tumble motion, but they can't because they're confined in this tight space. So for a cell to hop through the pore space, it needs to be able to find a straight line path that fits inside the pore space. And that actually has a name. That's called a chord, right? There's a function known as the chord length distribution function, which is a fundamental structural metric of heterogeneous porous media that quantifies the probability of finding a chord of a given length that fits inside the pore space. And because we can characterize the 3D structure of these porous media, Tapa actually measured the chord length distribution function. So that's these lines for four different porous media, four different average pore sizes. And as you see, as you make the pores tighter and tighter, the chords get shorter and shorter. And also the hopping lengths, which are given by the symbols, also get shorter and shorter, right? And it looks like the hopping length distribution is set by the chord length distribution function. So indeed, it looks like hopping is set by the geometry of the pore space. Right, and I also want to point out that here the orientations of the hops are isotropic because this is a random medium with no gradients. The cells aren't talking to each other. And so hopping is set by geometry. What about trapping? Right, we see that these cells get stuck in tight spots and then they try rattle around until they can get out. What determines the duration of that process? And uh, this again is something we've characterized in quite a lot of depth that we reported in the soft matter paper, but I'm just gonna highlight it with this movie that I think is very instructive. Here we have the cell body in green and the cell is constitutively exp expressing a green fluorescent protein, but we've also labeled the flagella in magenta. So I'll replay this movie. You can see these flagella are bundled. The cell is trying to move to the left, right? But it can't because there's an obstacle in front of it. So I'll play this one more time. You can see the cell's trying to move to the left, but there's something in front of it. So the cell body is constantly fluctuating until it finds the right orientation for the flagella to unbundle and rebundle somewhere else. And that enables the cell to move out when it gets stuck again and so on and so forth. 
And I want you to pay attention to this time scale. This, these flagella remain bundled for 11 seconds before they can unbundle and rebundle, right? By contrast, in bulk liquid, the flagella are unbundling and rebundling every two seconds, right? So it looks like confinement is actually suppressing the unbundling. It's like there's a rubber band around the flagella, right? The cell body is reorienting, and then finally, it finds the right orientation for this flagellum to unbundle. The flagella bundle reforms on this other side, and then the cell can continue to move in a different direction. So it looks like trapping, right, is related not just to the pore confinement, right, to the geometry of the pore space, but it also depends on the ability of the cell to actively reorient itself and unbundle its flagella, right? So flagellar mechanics is important here. And I wanna highlight Jasmine's talk from last week. Jasmine did a beautiful job of highlighting how flagellar mechanics influences um, cellular motility. Um, and this is yet another example of that. And so um, if you missed that, check it out. It's on YouTube. Um, it was a beautiful overview of this. And so we've thought about this as kind of like an entropic trapping process. We put the details of that model in the soft matter paper, but essentially these cells are like active particles that are trapped in entropic traps. They're constantly reorienting themselves, trying to find the right orientation so then they can get out. And so this is kind of like uh, an activated process, which you can model using an Arrhenius relationship, except now KT isn't driving this thing out, but its own activity is, which we describe by this parameter X, right? And so we think about this cell as navigating a disordered landscape of entropic traps, each of which has its own depth, C. Right. And so we're actually using this trapping model that's been applied in the glassy community for thermal systems. And here we're modifying it for this active particle. And the prediction is that the distribution of the trapping durations scales as a power law. It has a power law tail where the exponent of this power law is given by the, quant uh, the competition between how actively the cell is trying to get out and how deeply confining these traps are. Right. And so we can test this. Indeed, we see that these trapping duration distributions have these power law tails. This is a log log plot, right? And we can independently tune confinement and activity. So when we make the pores tighter and tighter, right, this exponent decreases. These distributions get broader and broader, right? The trapping gets longer and longer. Or alternatively, if we reduce the temperature and make the cells less and less active, we again see that this exponent decreases. The trapping gets longer and longer, the tails get longer and longer, right? And so it looks like trapping is determined by the competition between the activity of the cell and how confined it is in this pore space. But long story short, we don't have run and tumble motion in these heterogeneous media. Instead, we have this new mode of motility that we call hopping and trapping. This still looks like a random walk over large length and time scales, but it's a weird kind of random walk. It's a random walk where the characteristic length scale is set by the hopping length, which is determined by the pore space geometry. And the characteristic time now is set by the trapping duration, because that's a longer time scale. And we can predict and measure both of these quantities. And so we can, for example, take the mean hopping length, the mean trapping duration, put them together and calculate again the diffusion coefficient describing how these cells spread out in a heterogeneous medium over large length and time scales. And then we can test that. So what we did is we took a bolus of dilute cells, embedded it within a 3D heterogeneous porous medium, and just watched the leading edge spread out due to the motility of the cells. We can extract a diffusion constant from that and compare that to our simple prediction from the hopping and trapping model. And that's what I'm showing you here. The y-axis is a measurement, the x-axis is the prediction. These different symbols are for three different porous media. And we find really nice agreement. This line is a factor of three offset, right? And we think that factor of three arises from the fact that we're not treating these long tails. We're just using the mean hopping length and the mean trapping duration. But it seems to do a pretty good job. And just uh, to contrast this with a typical run and tumble model, where you take replace the length scale by the pore size, right? The prediction that's made is off your screen. It's all the way to the right over here, right? It's nearly two orders of magnitude off. So it looks like by 
analyzing this hopping and trapping, we can do a much better job at predicting how these cells randomly spread out over large length and time scales. Sajid, sorry to jump in, but you have two minutes. Perfect. So in the last few minutes, I'll just highlight the work we've been doing uh, on uh, the collective migration of dense populations. Okay, and to do this, we've been using another feature of these porous media that I haven't told you about. They're, they're like ball pits for cells, right? These are packings of particles. So they're yield stress materials, right? You can take an injection nozzle, right? Put it into the porous medium, extrude cells from it into the pore space at a defined location, mount it onto a position controlled stage, and then trace out any 3D structure you want. And you can embed cells within the pore space along that 3D path, right? So this is something that Tapa did previously with colloids. This is a side view, right? We can make microbial communities. We can 3D print uh, any microbial community of essentially any 3D structure and composition, right? So of course we have to 3D print the Princeton shield. These different colors are different depths, right? And we can make these out of bacteria. And so we've been having a lot of fun engineering microbial communities. I won't talk about that here, but I'll just mention to study collective migration, we 3D printed the simplest possible structure, which is a cylinder of dense packed cells, right? So this is a long cylinder. This is just a, a small section of it. We're taking a cross section through it, right? Each pixel here is a single cell. So this is way zoomed out, right? The overall width of your screen is thousands of cell body lengths, right? And this cylinder is embedded within one of these 3D heterogeneous media. And the question is, what happens? Now, initially I thought, you know, these cells are diffusing around, they're randomly moving around. This should just spread out diffusively. Here's what we saw instead. So this movie is gonna loop. Right? When Taba showed me this movie, I had gotten back in my chair and he showed me this movie and I fell right back down. Right? So now I use a standing desk because I just keep falling out of chairs. Here are the cells, right? they spread out initially, but then they form these coherent fronts. They self-organize into these coherent fronts that travel over large length and time scales. You can see this is tens of generations. And we've analyzed the features of this to death. We put this on the bioarchive recently. Please check that out. But long story short, oh, by the way, we can look at this from the side, right? Because we have 3D imaging. You can see this cylinder expanding. Um, and long story short, this is because the cells are consuming the nutrient around them, right? They set up a local gradient, and then they bias their motion in response to that local gradient and continue to propagate this gradient through consumption. And so you can actually model this using what's known as a Keller-Siegel equation. And we did, and we found that actually you have to modify this Keller-Siegel system of equations to include cellular collisions and confinement. Check out this paper if you're interested in that. Sajid, so, I'm uh, sorry, but you are at minus one minute now. Okay, perfect. Well, then I'll wrap up there. We've done lots of stuff looking at how these cells move in these traveling fronts, and we actually found that they chemotax very differently from the way they behave in bulk liquid. And the punchline here, if you take nothing else, is that in a heterogeneous medium, bacteria move completely differently than they do in bulk liquid or on flat surfaces. And this is something we've analyzed in quite a lot of detail. And I'd love to hear your questions or comments. Thank you all for listening. Um, and this is my amazing group who do all this awesome stuff. Thank you. Boy, you're muted. Yeah, I unmuted myself. So I, I just said, thanks, Sujit, for a wonderful talk. So I'm going to ask you a subset of questions uh, okay. from the chat box. And we can take the uh, more, you know, during the 15-minute Q&A later. So I have a question from uh, Kinjal Dasbiswas. And he's asking, is the cord link distribution exponential? Ah, that's a great question. So um, there have, there's been a lot of work on, you know, determining the cord length distribution for different kinds of media. Actually, my colleague here, um, Sal Torquato, has done a lot of that work. Um, it depends on the a porous medium, but in many heterogeneous media, yeah, it's kind of like a, a it, it can be approximated by an exponential distribution in many cases. Okay, and then there are two questions, related questions from Corey Joshua Her and Shen Jing, and the question is, is the unbundling rate constant in the hydrogel, or do you see different times between unbundling based on pore size 
follow-up question, is unbundling still dependent on the chemotactic signal? That's a great question. Um, so about the first question, um, the time scale between unbundling. So um, the, the, so first I just want to clarify, there's the time it takes um, for a cell to be stuck, right? And uh, sit there and wait for the flagella to unbundle and then move somewhere else. And that's essentially the trapping duration. And that's what we see, that's what we see here. So the trapping durations show these power law tails that indeed do depend on pore size. As you make the pores tighter and tighter, they remain trapped for longer and longer, and the, it takes longer and longer for the flagella to unbundle and rebundle and push the cell out in a different direction. Now, regarding the second question about chemotaxis, um, that's also a great question. So, and that gets to um, the work that we just published in this bioarchive paper. Um, you know, typically, the, the way E. coli chemotax in bulk liquid is they modulate the frequency with which they reorient, right? So if they're moving up a nutrient gradient, they suppress uh, uh, reorientation. So they make runs longer uh, up the gradient and shorter down the gradient. But the problem is they can't do this in a heterogeneous medium because the, the lengths of the hops are just set by geometry, right? They can't elongate hops because they hit a wall. And they can't shorten hops because the flagella are confined in this tight pore space. And so it turns out that the way they bias their motion in heterogeneous media is they actually hop more frequently up the gradient and less frequently down the gradient, right? Mm -hmm. And so this has actually been a puzzle uh, for a long time. It turns out that E. coli use these two distinct mechanisms mm -hmm. to bias their motion mm -hmm. in bulk liquid but this second mechanism is very weak. It only contributes 30% of the overall drift velocity. And it's been a puzzle. Why would they waste their energy employing two different mechanisms uh, when one is dominant? And the resolution that we found, and we put that in this bioarchive paper, is that in a porous medium, in a heterogeneous medium, they can't modulate the frequency of reorientation. So they must use the second mechanism where they bias the frequency with which they hop in the right direction and indeed we found that that's the case and so the punchline is that these bacteria use multiple mechanisms to bias their motion because it enables them to direct perform directed motion in different environments awesome so sujit we are going to move on to end stock now and we will take more questions for both